Um, yeah. So we are recording. If you can keep your mics and your cameras off, that would be very helpful. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us for our Lunch and Learn webinar. Uh, so my name is Deanne. I'll be your host today. Uh, I'm a volunteer coordinator and board member with a friend of the Samyama Bay Society. Um, just want to thank really quickly the UBC Teacher Education for hosting us on Zoom today. Um, and yeah, so we'll have a couple really great speakers here with us um, that'll give some insight into some ongoing projects and research that really contributes to the survival of forage fish and the species that depend on them as well. So uh, just before I start, I just want to really gratefully acknowledge that a lot of our work in Boundary Bay takes place on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including Semiamu and Swashin nations. Um, I myself am also coming in from the unceded lands of the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Stolo First Nations um, in the Maple Ridge area. And I'm really happy to be able to contribute to stewardship of these areas, also recognizing the ongoing contributions of the Coast Salish peoples as stewards of these territories and we're committed to honoring their inherent rights, serenity, and cultural heritage. So to start a little bit on Friend the Samuel Bay Society, um, it was incorporated as a nonprofit in 2001 uh, with a vision of engaging community in the protection and preservation of the Boundary Bay watershed. Uh, with a mission to preserve, restore, and increase knowledge of the ecological values of the Boundary Bay ecosystem, uh, and its watersheds. So what we do uh, in the community uh, with community partners, we focus on planting coastal and in indigenous species, the removal of invasives and environmental education in the community and in schools. This can include community science methods workshops like eelgrass mapping or waterfowl and oyster surveys. And then some of our more recent projects um, like European green crab trapping in partnership with DFO. And uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, the forage fish spawning habitat monitoring as well with the Coastal Forage Fish Network. So uh, our speakers for today, as you can see on the screen here, um, just thank you so much for our speakers and their time um, to present to us uh, during a really busy time of the year for many people in the field. Um, so Jacqueline's gonna start us off today um, to chat about forage fish, their critical ecological role and the utility of community stewards and conservation. Uh, sorry, Jacqueline is a forage fish research and monitoring project lead uh, a spatial, and a spatial ecologist who joined Project Watershed in 2023. She finished her master's of science in forest and conservation science from UBC, um, where her research focused on addressing management gaps to su better support conservation decisions for beach spawning forage fish. And through her work, Jacqueline does see a need for more cross-disciplinary and relationship-focused approaches to resource use and land management. So through her work with Project Watershed, uh, she aims to use collaborative nature-based approaches to contribute to meaningful and effective forage fish conservation. Um, and this supports a more resilient, sustainable ecosystem for every, everyone. Uh, Will uh, will be presenting on uh, salmon diets and herring science. He has, a, he has been a postdoctoral researcher working at the Vic University of Victoria and is now a Pacific Salmon Foundation senior biologist. He's leading the Chinook Salmon Winter Ecology component of the Bottlenecks to Survival Study. He also initiated and continues to oversee the Adult Salmon Diet Program at UVic. He's a lifelong salmon enthusiast, having worked as a recreational uh, fishing guide and has been a salmon stock assessment biologist as well. He completed a master's in crustacean reproduction and development and a PhD in juvenile Chinook salmon marine ecology under the umbrella of uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation's 
Salish Sea Marine Survival Program. Um, so those are our presenters for today and uh, Jacqueline will kick it off for us. Oh, thanks Diane. That was, that was great. I haven't uh, gone over that bio in a little while and I'm, yeah, I sound impressive. I'm impressed with myself. Uh, all right. Thanks for having me. Um, it's an honor to get to talk and to um, subject you all to my favorite topic, which I spend a lot of time uh, working on. So, um, <clears throat> so this talk, I, I've called it Forge Fish, their critical ecological role in the utility of community stewards in conservation. And I want to talk a lot about how community stewards and community scientists can get involved. So these like citizen scientists might have been a word that you've heard, same idea. Um, local folks, maybe not formally trained in science, but going out and caring about the nature in their backyard and getting involved and how that can have a big impact on the science we do and ultimately how we manage our resources and how we conserve um, these small forge fish, which are important to the rest of the ecosystem. So, oh. okay, so um, so you know a little bit who I am. Uh, I work for a nonprofit called Project Watershed. They're based in Courtney and um, Project Watershed is, is well known for their restoration projects. We have a really big one going on right now called Couscous Sum. And it's, um, it's just a great example of taking uh, an old industrial site and restoring it to an active estuary. And um, our forage fish project is a little different. It's a lot more research focused and it's very citizen science heavy. So I am gonna give you quite a bit of overview on, on some of what that looks like today. Um, and I've been working with Project Watershed since last June as their forage fish project lead. Uh, but before that I did my masters all on forage fish. So. I do a lot of forge fish work. And so what are forge fish? So this is a really broad category and I'm showing them in this image kind of in the middle as an intertrophic level or sort of like middle of the food web. And they are usually small fish. They're not always fish though. Um, sometimes they're called bait fish or prey fish. This is not a formal genetic category it's um, an ecological classification. It's forage fish denotes the role that these small fish play in our ecosystem. And um, some rough examples are, you know, ooligan and, and herring, but it could also include squid or shrimp. So it could be quite broad. And um, what's really important about these species is that they play this bridge role, bringing tiny plankton at the bottom of our food chain. And <clears throat> these are small zooplankton or phytoplankton that large predators wouldn't normally eat. And they take that energy by eating them and move it up, making it available to the larger predators. Usually these are the ones that we are most concerned about in our cultures or economies. And um, without fortress bridging that middle zone, we wouldn't get that energy flow. And sometimes this is called like a wasp waste ecosystem. Um, and it's, uh, it's they're a bit of a bottleneck here in the Pacific Northwest in these cold coastal upwelling systems. So um, forage fish species, they are, are many. There are so many of them. So here is a list of about 27 species that I've come across and I've just slowly been gathering anytime someone says, oh, blah, 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 species is really important. Um, I just make sure to write it down on my list. It's not conclusive, um, but it's, <clears throat> as you can see, already quite large. Um, some of the species I come across the most, think about the most and talk about the most in this area um, are Northern anchovy, Pacific sand lance, Pacific herring, and surf smelt. And, I'll talk a little bit more about them today and Will will also talk to you more about them. But um, these are the ones that come up the most and, and we, we interact and see them the most. Um, forage fish have hundreds of known predators. Um, 
and they, they play an important role supporting these. Some are particularly important at different times of the year. Um, for example, Pacific sand lamps, they're a long, skinny forage fish. Kind of think of them like a nice fat udon noodle without any spikes or spines on it. And it's um, particularly important in seabird uh, rearing uh, season. So when the seabirds are breeding and they have little chicks. And so this photo of this rhinoceros auklet um, has loaded up its bill and it's going to take it back to its nest. And the chicks are, are just going to be able to slurp them right down like big fat noodles um, full of energy. So, um, and, and not only are they really important to the predators that specifically feed on them, they're also important to food webs. So I'm showing this photo of an orca eating a uh, Chinook eating a sand lance. I've added the sand lance in there. It's not a real photo of the <laughs> with the sand lance, but it is a real photo of the Chinook chasing the salmon. Um, and you can like you can just see how these are connecting our whole ecosystem together. Um, but forage fish are data deficient. They're poorly studied. So here's some examples for you that I've pulled together of the number of research papers from the web of science. So think of the web of science as Google for research papers. And um, if you pop in Pacific salmon, and I did this maybe a year ago now, so it might be the numbers might be updated a bit, but the ratios are going to be the same. For Pacific sand, salmon, you get just over 8,000 papers. And if you pop in Pacific herring, there's only 1,000, almost 600 papers at the time. So a bit more. Um, if you pop in Pacific sand lance, that number drops to 175 research papers. And if you pop in surf smelt, there's only 27. So there's some species we really know just about nothing about. And being data deficient means that there's little um, management dollars and resources invested in these species. It means that there's no maps telling project proponents where the species is, meaning where they can and can't do something. There's not a lot of information about when they spawn or where they spawn. And so that is often sensitive critical habitat that needs to be avoided or at least accounted for when there's projects happening. And that just doesn't happen if we just don't know anything about that species. So it's easy for data deficient species like forage fish to fall through the crack. And um, yeah, here's some examples. I used to work in consulting and it was very rare. I, like, I can't think of any time I was asked to do something on forage fish and I was working on marine projects. So I think this has changed over the last five or so years that are becoming more part of projects, but without more information, this um, these species fall through the cracks. So <clears throat> this is where citizen science can play a really important role. There isn't a lot of information on these species because it costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, and there just simply isn't enough people going into research to answer all of these questions. And uh, I want to talk about the Forge Fish Network, which is um, started out in the early 2000s in Canada, um, primarily led by this scientist, Ramona de Graff. And she had learned how to do um, beach spawning surveys. And she'd gone down to the US and learned their techniques where they have been doing it since about the 70s. So they do a lot more. And she brought those techniques back and many small nonprofit groups started doing this work as well. And so it kind of formed organically. And then in about 2017, um, MABRI, which is uh, Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Research Institute, um, learned these techniques and really formalized with several other groups. And it really just took off from about 2017. Um, and now there's, uh, well, I'll show a slide later, but I think there's about 23 organizations in the Coastal Forage Fish Network. And um, the purpose of the network is to be a supportive group that has financial and data power where we can come together, talk to each other about what we're seeing, when we're seeing beach spawners, um, forge fish, and um, gather resources towards monitoring them. Most of the groups are nonprofits or First Nations, um, but there are some government biologists and academics like myself earlier on, uh, students, and many, many volunteers make up these groups. The Fortress Network at this time 
primarily focuses on the uh, benthic and sort of beach spawners. So these are surf smelt and Pacific sandlings, and they spawn on beaches, which is kind of a fun uh, place to be. It means that I go to a lot of beaches, and so I'm essentially now a beach biologist. Unfortunately, sand lance spawn in November, December, so it is not always the nicest time to be out there. And um, the network does do some other work on other species, but uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be focused on the beach spawners because that's just where a lot of the effort has been focused on over the last few years. And um, yeah, this is a nice beach out in uh, just on Felice Island, just across from Tofino. I have so many photos of nice beaches, though, it's very hard to put together a presentation. And so um, the beach spawners, they require very specific habitat. And it's thanks to all these citizen science scientists and community groups that have gone out to beaches in their backyard and really put the bulk of this information together for our area. And um, they lay these tiny little eggs. You can see um, in the, some of these photos how small the eggs are. They are about one millimeter across. And um, they hang out on the beach for anywhere from two weeks to a month, depending on the time of year and the species. And uh, both the sand lance and surf smell eggs are about the same size. They, they both need very specific habitat, and it has to be coarse sand or gravel, like tiny gravel. Silt free is really important, so it doesn't clog their gills, and um, has to have high oxygen. And so these areas um, need to exist in, in relative um, stability, so they need to kind of be there year after year somewhat. And they are dynamic, so sometimes these suitable places show up only in the winter or only in the summer. Um, if you think about how our storms work in the winter in the CRC. But there's critical to the existence um, of sandlands and surf smelt. So without these specific beaches, these species wouldn't be around. And they, they tie these species to specific geographical areas. Um, that is a tool we can use in management to make sure that if we protect these areas, then that can help ensure that these species are around for our larger predators that we care a lot about. And uh, I just want to give you another rough idea. So not all beaches are created equal. You know, usually us people really like that really fine sand beaches, but um, these fish prefer slightly coarser, more working towards a gravel beach area. And um, they, you'll, they'll also use um, broken up shells like shell hash beaches as well. This is uh, some photos of just what it looks like when we go out. Um, all ages can can participate, and um, some of it can be a little bit technical, but a lot of it is mostly just playing in water. And uh, we do some vortexing and sieving, so it's uh, a fun process. Here's a map showing you a lot of the effort that has gone on in the Canadian side of the Salish Sea. So any circle that's blue means a survey was done, but no eggs were found. Anywhere that's pink means uh, Pacific sand lakes, eggs or DNA has been found on that beach. And anywhere that's yellow is for surf smell. And you can see that the yellow dots are all clustered around the southern end of Vancouver Island. This is a good moment for me to pause and uh, talk about that this work all takes place in the Salish Sea. And I want to recognize that um, this is the traditional unceded territories and homes of many Indigenous people, well over 100 different groups. Um, some examples include the Wasonic or the Musqueam and the Comox. And um, not all um, are unceded, but most uh, are, and, and few have treaties. But I, I want to point out that many of these ecosystems, um, some of them anyways, are have a human connection. And some of them, the very existence of these beaches are because people were living nearby on the beach. And um, it was through these practices that people had living here and um, working the land that some species persisted. And they didn't just persist, I guess they thrived. And I think the more we can do to regain um, 
those practices and for people to regain access and, and sovereignty over their own lands, the more biodiversity will benefit. I also want to point out, so here are just some of our, not some, these are most, if not all, I think, of the Fortress Network um, partners. Actually, Friends of Semi Bay might not be on here yet. <laughs> I made this just probably before we started working together. I'll have to add that one. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of groups, and it's an active um, uh, network, where, and we meet every two months and, and talk about what we're seeing and how we can get together and improve and learn. So <clears throat> kind of in summary, Coastal Foragers Network has done a lot of great work for forage fish, in particular beach spawners. And um, I did some, some work with this data. And so in, in the period 2001 until 2021, 2,655 surveys were completed and they took place on 180 unique beaches. So these numbers have since grown substantially. Um, but up until 2021, eggs have been found 236 times and that was on 94 beaches. So sometimes uh, not sometimes, like often, eggs are found on the same beach year after year after year. Um, but there are 94 beaches out there, at least. And uh, here, this not as glamorous black and white map is showing you um, a triangle is anywhere where Pacific sand lance eggs had been found. So this is a really great data set. And Coastal Forage Network had the foresight to make it publicly accessible. And you can all go look it up yourselves on the Strait of Georgia Data Center, which is um, amazing. And, and the network is ahead of its time in terms of getting data out there to the public. And so we can use this community science and stewardship efforts to contribute to meaningful con conservation. Um, so for my master's, I used that data to build a habitat suitability model, which essentially just think of it as a map. Um, that shows us where Pacific sand lamp spawning is. And so to do that, I needed these observations of where the eggs are. I took the observations, plus I took a bunch of data sets um, all in different layers that describe uh, intertidal areas in the Salish Sea. So these are things like, what is the fetch of a shoreline? What is the slope of a shoreline? What is the sediment of that shoreline? And these are large data sets that exist um, often collected by the, the federal government or by the provincial government, sometimes smaller groups will collect these, um, but usually to do the modeling, you need them on a really large scale. And um, then you put those together uh, into software. I used a program called R, it's actually free, and it's just like statistical coding software. It was really terrible to have to learn how to do all that. I'm a biologist, I know how to like ID fish, I don't really know how to code, but I learned. So. Um, I put all that together using an algorithm. I used one called Maxent or Maxim Entropy. And uh, when you put all that together, run some stats, you get this nice heat map that shows you, okay, places, it gives you value essentially, like higher values are more likely to have suitable habitat and lower values are less likely. And you can turn that into a heat map where you say like any values that are over 90, let's give it red and any values under 50, let's give it blue. And so you make a heat map of that. And this is what it looks like for three key areas um, in the Salish Sea. I'm showing you uh, Sydney and James Islands, which is a real hot spot. If you've ever been out to Sydney Spit, you know that that is just full of sand lance spawning. Um, and Seacombe Harbor, not that far from where the ferry terminal comes in, ferry comes in in Victoria. Um, another really great hot spot for both sand lance and surf smell. I'm showing you um, Goose Spit in the very top end of Denman Island. Uh, in the center panel, and then of course Vancouver in the um, far panel. I could have, I guess, I could have shown Samiami Bay. Most of it is actually not great spawning habitat for Pacific sandlands and surf smelt because most of it is all muddy. But there are some great beaches on the edges, like in um, White Rock, and all along as you get closer to um, uh, what's called there, um, Point Roberts. So. <clears throat> So this is really great information. Um, it's, it gives us a map. How can we use this to inform decisions? Well, I did say it's a map, but it's actually more than a map. It's a tool. So we get that community science um, going out and 
they are all just going to one or two beaches a few times a year in their backyard to look for these eggs. So it is a time commitment, um, but they're getting out there and they're doing the monitoring and they're seeing things happen in their own backyards on their on their own beaches. Um, and it's it would be really hard for any one researcher or one organization to do as much work as the network is doing collaboratively. And they all follow a similar method and they submit all their data to the Strait of Georgia Data Center. Then I'm able to go and download that, make this nice map, and then I can use it um, to do a few different things, a few different tools. So I'm just gonna breeze through this page. But the first thing I can do is use it to assess the quantity of habitat. So I can look at how much high likelihood habitat is there, like the red stuff, and how much low likelihood habitat is there. And what does that tell us? It can tell us how rare um, this habitat is and how much it needs to be protected. Um, we can also look at changes over time, like how much is there now? And then I could look at how much was there some other time. Um, and when I, when I break that down, um, the whole intertidal area of the Salish Sea, this first really big bar, makes up about 522 kilometers squared. And then if I look at each of these categories, they are a category of likelihood. So um, what, what I want to draw your attention to is this box on the far right, is that the habitat that we think is highly likely to have suitable spawning habitat only makes up about seven kilometers squared. So we can conclude that sandlant spawning habitat in the Salish Sea is rare, patchy, and uncommon. And it makes up about 5.4% of the entire area, not a lot. Um, so that's the first thing we can do. The next thing we can do is identify potential habitat in areas we haven't yet been to. So this is, I think, the most powerful version of the tool. Um, so this is Blubber Bay, where the ferry terminal comes in uh, between Powell River and Texada Island. And I've, I happen to have been there, but we've never done surveys there. So if I look at the model, what does it tell me about this area? Oh, well, it looks like it's pretty hot. Looks like there's probably a lot of suitable habitat there um, because it's really red, meaning the values are closer or above 90. And um, that's important information for governments to know, for people who are approving permits. If someone wants to build a dock or if, say, this, this mine that's down there, I think that that one is currently inactive, but Say someone wanted to reactivate it. Well, it'd be great for the government who's going to do some regulation about how and when work happens and what restoration or mitigation has to be done, that they know where this habitat is and how much of it is available. Um, the next thing, so yeah, the next thing we can do is identify drivers. So we can use the model and ask it like, Okay, I put in all these different layers. Which layer was the most important? How do they each contribute? And one thing that we found was that estuaries are actually the top predictor of suitable Pacific sandland spawning habitat. And that was a bit of a surprise. I would have expected it to be sediment type on the beach, but it turns out that that information we have is not the greatest because it changes so much. But estuaries did a really great job at predicting it. And that's probably because estuaries help drive where sand comes from. And um, it also highlights the importance of inter-ecosystem connectivity. So you think of freshwaters as kind of one ecosystem and the marine beaches as a different ecosystem. If we build dikes and jetties that can cut them off from each other, then we potentially lose that source of sand that makes those beaches what they are. Okay, and the last thing we can do, and this is very close to the end of my presentation, I know I'm a minute or two over here, um, we can use it to expand into new areas. So uh, the BC coast is huge, and um, we currently uh, have done just the Salish Sea, this green highlighted area, but we need to take this model up the coast. We can also use it to go look at different times. So maybe we could look at information you can use the information and forecast it forward. How will this, how will these beaches change in the future under climate change? Blah, 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 blah. So, oops. Pretty cool uh, tool. It's more than just a map. Um, and it gives us a lot of information going forward. Um, so the next thing I'm doing is working on building a habitat suitability model 
for the west coast of Vancouver Island for sand land. I also want to do the same thing for surf smelt, but in the Salish Sea. It's just harder because we have far fewer observations of them. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to me. Um, and I'd love if we have time for questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat or uh, you can unmute if you'd like to ask the question directly. Um, I might just start with a question we had uh, from our registration list. Um, someone was asking if there are local forage fish species under any sort of protections, and if so, which ones? Okay, great question. And um, so all fish are protected under the Federal Fish Act, and uh, it protects both the fish and their habitat. Um, that can get a little bit hard sometimes and nuanced. If, like I said, if, if species are data deficient, they just don't get captured. Um, regulators can't force a proponent to do something if they don't have evidence that that species is there or that you know a certain um, activity would harm them. So it, it's great that we can't um, uh, proponents can't just go and. Um, do things without government permissions in terms of fish habitat or, and fish themselves. But it goes the other way too, where government can't ask proponents to, to take steps without evidence either. So yeah, more information on forage fish will help get them better protected. And um, there are a number of species that are listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act, uh, including some... Uh, some some like some of the rock fishes are protected under the Federal Species at Risk Act. Uh, some subpopulations of salmon are protected. And I, I don't know if you noticed in my long list, juvenile salmon can be considered forage fish. Um, that gets tricky because like, how do you know where a certain individual or a group of fish are coming from? And then um, ooligan are Listed under Kasiwik, it this is kind of probably getting too far down. They're not actually protected under SARA, though, under the by the political process. They're recommended to be protected, so not yet, maybe soon. And um, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. But if anybody wants, you could look up under the SARA registry yourself if you had specific fish in mind. Sandlands and surf smelt, no specific protections other than the Fish Act for them. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, definitely goes to show how important this work is. Erin's yeah. uh, got a question. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Sorry, that was actually my question, but I'm being selfish and asking another. Nice. Um, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, Jacqueline, did you also potentially look into, you were saying that you worked on some restoration work um, in Interior BC, but uh, is there any uh, interest in doing restoration work for those areas that you've identified as maybe like low but have potential oh yeah yeah um part of my work we are doing some restoration work and we're still trying to figure out where the best place to highlight is it, it restoring shorelines for forage fish is still kind of in its infancy um there's a lot more focus being put on freshwater uh, habitat restoration work. And, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. A lot of our shorelines, um, as soon as you get north of the Salish Sea, are mostly what they used to be. Um, a bit more wilderness, a bit fewer people, maybe changing and maintaining, say, clam gardens or, yeah, I don't know, kelp beds or whatever. But um, here in the Salish Sea, there's a lot more modification. And um, yeah, it's we're, there's some restoration happening. Peninsula Stream Society is a, is a nonprofit that did some really cool shoreline restoration work in Sandwich area. And they had some success doing restoration on a beach where there used to be spawning and then the, a road went in. And so part of the road uh, kind of armored the shoreline, making it hard, adding riprap right into the intertidal zone. And so they lost a bunch of beach that way over some 
just over a, a, a long-term process called uh, like beach coarsening where the sand becomes cobble. And um, so they did some restoration work and now they get spawning there. So that's a cool project. Awesome, that's cool to hear. I just, uh, I live in Squamish and we recently had some work done to the estuary to restore that area. And there's been massive herring spawns and a lot of work on the herring as a forage fish. I know that they're particularly interest, but yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential, particularly for herring. Um, but I think we'll chat more a bit about herring. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for your question, Erin. Um, I think in the interest of time, we might move on to Will, but if you have any questions, uh, throw them in the chat. We can pass them over to Jack and get those answers to you if you'd like as well. All right. Go ahead, Will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, can people see that and hear me? All good. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to be here, and thank you, um, Jack, for that awesome introduction to the forage fish and all the really cool work you're doing. Um, what I want to talk about today is salmon diets and herring science, and so there'll be a couple of different pieces to this, and uh, the survival angle will be probably more about how forage fish contribute to salmon survival than, than maybe the survival of the forage fish themselves. And there is a bit of a citizen science angle in here as well, talking about the adult salmon diet program and uh, some of the work that uh, that we're doing with anglers to, to use salmon diets as an ecosystem monitoring tool. All of this work is led by Pacific Salmon, well, supported or led by Pacific Salmon Foundation's Marine Science Program. And so the Marine Science Program is uh, is led by um, Dr. Isabel Persall. So I just want to acknowledge her. And there's a uh, a link to to some of the um, where you can see all the all the work that's being done by the Marine Science Program there at the bottom. And I also want to acknowledge some of what I'm going to show today ha has been led or put together by others, including Jessica Qualley, who's a biologist with PSF and a graduate student at UVic. Katie Innes, who's a biology student, or sorry, who's a, a biologist with PSF. Wes Greentree, who's a PhD student at UVic, and a lot of the work is done in Francis Juanes' his lab at UVic, which is uh, where where I did my graduate work as well. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about juvenile salmon diets, and so that's some work that that I did um, back around 2015, 2016 uh, in the Southern Gulf Islands as part of uh, the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. Uh, and also some more recent work we've been doing to look at overwinter diets of juvenile chinook. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the Adult Salmon Diet Program, which is a uh, a project that is working with rec anglers. And then a couple of the questions uh, and interesting results that came out of this work have, have directly or indirectly led to uh, a herring and salmon interactions uh, BC TRIF project, which is being led by the Marine Science Program. So that's the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, which is a, a federal and provincial uh, grant program to support uh, to support salmon recovery. Uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll have time for some questions. So Jack already did a really nice job of introducing this. Uh, forage fish play this key role in transferring nutrients from, from the bottom of the food chain to the top. Uh, Jack also mentioned the idea of a wasp waste, which is kind of illustrated by this figure. So it's the idea that often in a system, relatively few species at that waste of the food chain um, transfer energy from a really diverse community of zooplankton to a really diverse community of predators. And in the Salish Sea, uh, key species, as mentioned by Jack, are, um, are anchovy, northern anchovy, Pacific herring, and sandlands. Because relatively few species play such an outsized role in, in energy transfer, changes at that wasp waste to the ecosystem could be really important. So the loss of a species, the change in relative abundance of the species, uh, each of these species have different reproductive histories, they have different migrations, they have different um, developmental timing. So when you change the composition of the waste of the ecosystem, it can have really major consequences. So that kind of underpins a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today. 
So first, to talk about juvenile salmon. Now, there's quite a bit of research that I won't go through that indicates that for Pacific salmon in general, survival is positively related to growth rate. So when juvenile salmon grow well in the marine environment, uh, they have higher survival, and in turn, we get more adult salmon uh, either to spawn in rivers or to, to eat or catch or to be consumed by marine predators like southern resident killer whales. We also know that for Chinook salmon and coho salmon as well, particularly in the Salish Sea, growth is positively related to piscivory. So when uh, juvenile salmon have access to fish prey, they grow faster. And so this is just a figure from some work that was done in Puget Sound, which demonstrated really clearly that uh, in regions where juvenile Chinook uh, were consuming Pacific sand lands and Pacific herring, uh, they were growing much faster than in other regions. So we're pretty confident about these two points. And in the Canadian Salish Sea, herring are overwhelmingly the most important forage for prey of juvenile Chinook, and specifically age zero herring. So this, this is a, a, a juvenile Chinook actually jumping. If you look closely in the disturbed water in front of him, you can see some little silver splashes, silver flashes. So those are actually age zero herring, uh, and that fish is coming down into that school from above. Um, it's age zero herring that are important. So for fish, Chinook and coho in their first marine year, they're only capable of eating herring in their first year. So that's an important point that, uh, that we'll come to here. So these are just some results from some diet work I did. This is from 2015 in the Southern Gulf Islands. Um, and these are uh, prey types ranked top to bottom by their proportion in diets. And so the arrow at the bottom is indicating that Herring are the most important item in diets by weight, making up about a quarter of all the food consumed by juvenile salmon, juvenile chinook. About a quarter of the total weight proportion, but only about a little bit less than 10% of salmon are actually eating herring, which is another point that I'll come back to. But when herring were present, stomachs are about two to three times fuller than with other prey. Certainly, this is just one example. There's many examples from other, other survey programs as well but herring very, very important in diets. This is from recent work that we've been doing in winter, following Chinook through the winter uh, in the Strait of Georgia in their first winter in the ocean. So this is work in my Katie Ennis, and this is a plot of diet uh, energy content by date for stomachs which contain no herring in green or herring in yellow. And the takeaway message here is there's a slight decline in, in energy content of diets through the winter. But fish that are eating herring have, on average, twice the energy content in their diet of fish that aren't. So again, I could show lots of different examples of this. I've just picked two. But herring are super, super important for the growth and, and in turn, the survival of juvenile chinook. But we have evidence when we look at the literature that historically, juvenile herring were even more important in juvenile chinook diets and that access to juvenile herring appears to have become more limited over recent decades. So why might that, that be? And there's a few possibilities. The picture on the bottom left shows you a, a typical first ocean winter Chinook with a typical first winter herring from its stomach. You can see that that's a pretty big meal. And what we found, particularly during summer, and the figure on the right shows two years of data with date along the bottom of the graph and um, fish length uh, from from bottom to top on the y-axis. And it shows the increase in the size of Chinook from July through October in those two years, with Chinook containing anything other than herring in blue and Chinook containing herring in green. You can see that across both years, it's the larger juvenile Chinook that contain herring. So it appears that at least in some areas, we have uh, some sort of size limitation. Only the larger fish in the population are actually able to consume herring which is perhaps different than it was in prior decades where some of the literature accounts suggest that essentially all juvenile Chinook contain herring for most of the summer, particularly in the same region in the Southern Gulf Islands. So what could be going on? There's a few possibilities for causes and change in access to juvenile herring. Um, we've lost diversity of spawning sites. We've lost diversity in space and we've also lost diversity in time. Um, herring in the Strait of Georgia now tend to have their spawn very, very concentrated along the east coast of Vancouver Island during a short period, whereas historically they spawned in a more geographically and temporally distributed uh, pattern. 
One of the most interesting losses of a spawning stock component that's very close to uh, Boundary Bay is the loss of the Cherry Point herring stock. So this was formerly the largest component of the uh, Washington State Inside Waters herring stocks. Um, and that Cherry Point stock has completely collapsed. Cherry Point herring are late spawners. They actually spawned in April, even into May. And as a result, they would have produced smaller juvenile herring. Um, you know, a later spot hatch date means a smaller size at, at any particular date in the summer. So it's potential that the loss of, of, of genetic diversity in these separate spawning stocks could have changed the size of uh, juvenile herring that are available to juvenile salmon. There could also have been shifts in the size or growth of the herring and salmon themselves uh, due to climate change, competition, and other factors. So I think the bottom line here is it's complicated. Um, we know that juvenile salmon need herring to eat, uh, need forage fish to eat. We know that herring are super important in the Canadian Salish Sea. And we know that where, when, and at what size those herring are available can be really, really important. And we don't really know through time wants to change. So I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk. But uh, for now, I want to move on and talk a little bit about the British Columbia Adult Salmon Diet Program. So this is another PSF funded project that's been run out of the WANAS lab since 2017. And the impetus for this work is, you know, as I've just pointed out, and as Jack discussed, forage fish are really important and the details of their presence uh, in the ecosystem, when they're there, uh, what size they're there, what life stages are there are really important. And as the ocean changes, we can anticipate that that is going to change. And uh, we know the ocean's changing. This is just the time series of sea surface temperature anomalies from BT uh, light stations. So change is inevitable. Um, and we need to understand and monitor that change to understand implications for salmon uh, and other uh, valuable ecosystem components. So that was the, the impetus behind the adult salmon diet program. Uh, we had this idea that we could combine predator diet sampling and citizen science as a way to understand uh, forage fish communities in British Columbia. Uh, diet studies are used quite widely to understand uh, ecosystem function. And so I've just put up the title of one paper here that is working with seabird diets to do that. Seabird diets are often studied because you can just uh, take a graduate student at a, um, at a nesting colony and they can... Uh, they can monitor what seabirds are bringing back to their chicks and their bills. Um, with salmon, our idea was to use the, the nearly year-round um, recreational fishery uh, for Chinook and Coho in the Strait of Georgia as a way to monitor um, forage fish in those ecosystems. So we work with recreational anglers, we hand out data cards, um, and then the anglers actually collect the fish. Uh, they collect all the catch data associated um, Sorry, no, they don't collect the fish. They collect the fish in the gut. And uh, all the catch data associated with where and when they caught the fish, and then they uh, they submit those to us. So the, the objectives of this work in the short term, we did want to address some basic knowledge gaps about ship and coal and salmon diets in BC. We think we know all that, but actually there hasn't been any work published on adult diets um, with data more recent than the 1960s. We wanted to also improve our understanding of forage species ecology. We saw a value in developing and maintaining a citizen science network in and of itself to have that two-way dialogue between fishers and uh, fishery scientists. And we wanted to use uh, salmon as a way to monitor ecosystem chain. So we have a kind of, uh, we need to both engage anglers in, to get them to participate in this program. And then we need to, uh, to maintain that engagement through time. And so we've done a bunch of outreach for this. We've done various articles um, in different uh, publications to, to get the word out, online posts. Uh, we offer a draw prize or draw prizes every year. I think Islander Reels and Island Fisherman Magazine donate eight tackle works. Uh, a number of companies donate prizes and we draw prizes every year. We provide um, program swag to folks who contribute a certain number of stomachs. And then we also have an annual report of results and then individualized reports. So every angler who contributes stomachs gets an individual report of the diet data for the fish they submitted and how it compares to the diets of, uh, of other fish within the same region. And just a quick sense of the scope to date started in 2017. This slide's about eight months old, so the numbers would be even higher now. But we have over 250 participants, over 4,400 stomachs analyzed, over 13,600 prey records, 
We've archived otoliths from lots of prey fish. And we have lots of personnel trained on prey ID, a number of whom have gone on to, to graduate school. So it's been it's been a pretty fun program to, to be a part of. And this is just an idea of spatial scope. Obviously, we've got our best coverage within um, the Canadian Salish Sea. And for Chinook, uh, we get more samples in the summer, obviously, when fishing is more active. But we do get samples throughout the year. And uh, we're getting, you know, in the order of 600 samples a year now. So what do we see? What's this program um, revealing about spatial patterns and diets? I'll just go through this really quickly, um, but it's kind of neat. For sandlands, for example, we have a very strong regional pattern, uh, particularly in the summer. We have a real sandlands uh, hotspot in Harrow Strait and also quite a lot of sandlands on the west coast of Vancouver Island. In the winter, that Harrow Strait hotspot is even more pronounced. Relatively low encounters of sandlands um, within most of the Strait of Georgia. I should also mention this is a frequency of occurrence plot. So the, the gray circles indicate the sample size at any given location for all samples examined, whereas the colored uh, circle superimposed is the number of those samples which contain the, the species of interest. For northern anchovy, another really interesting pattern we we know that northern anchovy are concentrated in the lower mainland area and mainland inlets, particularly in the summer, um, very much um, within uh, the entrances to House Sound and along the Sunshine Coast, very few in other regions. Again, another House Sound hotspot in the winter. For squid, relatively little utilization of squid within the Canadian Salish Sea in summer, but lots on the west coast of Vancouver Island. For mctophids, which are lanternfish, they're an interesting little um, mesopelagic fish that are actually quite deep in the water column. Um, there's a couple of really pronounced hotspots uh, at the entrances to the Canadian Salish Sea, um, both uh, in Harrow Strait and then also up just at the entrance to Discovery Passage. Possibly something to do with current infection. But that's, that's a story, but kind of neat. So we're seeing these pretty strong spatial patterns in diet. Are they consistent through time? When we look at this by year, so these panels are now different regions from left to right, Juan de Fuca, Gulf Islands, House Sound, Strait of Georgia, and West Coast, Vancouver Island. Within each, we have year along the x-axis, and the top panels are summer and the bottom panels are winter. So this is a time series for both summer and winter for each. And this is a partial fullness index. So the colors tell you what the fish have been eating, and the height of the bar tells you how full the fish were. So an overall higher bar means fish are fuller, um, lower bar means fish are less full. And the little numbers show you the sample size. So some strong, consistent patterns. One is that in how sound you see that orange, which is uh, anchovy, which we don't see to nearly the same extent in other regions. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, um, we have, there's actually a mistake on that. Ah, it was a mistake on my legend there. That blue should be squid, not gadgets. My apologies. But there is no mistake on the uh, on that gray purple with herring. So herring are overwhelmingly the most important diet item. They are the most important diet item in all regions. And in the Strait of Georgia, they overwhelm all other diet items to an even greater extent, particularly in summer. Another point is that in the Strait of Georgia, stomachs are fuller than in other regions. So we have these really high importance of herring and really full stomachs in the Strait of Georgia. I also mentioned, because I know a lot of folks here are really interested in sandlands, which is orange. This figure underestimates the importance of sandlands. The reason for that is we've only selected uh, stomachs here from a period that is open across all years for retention of Chinook, which is excluding the April to July period which is when we see the most sandlands in diets. So I would say sandlands are really important, um, just not in this figure. It, it suggests they're less important than they are. Herring are super important. Um, what size and age are the herring that these salmon are consuming? And so this is a really similar figure, but it now breaks out the herring that are in the diets into three age classes based on size. And so the point I wanna make here is that in the Strait of Georgia, in summer, you see that diets are dominated by those gray bars, and those are age two plus herring. This is a really interesting point because the Strait of Georgia herring population is generally considered to be migratory. 
So what we're finding is that adult herring that haven't migrated out of the Strait of Georgia to the West Coast are actually the most important diet item in Chinook salmon stomachs in summer. So it's a really important point because this is a sort of a little a not fully understood component of the population, basically the resident herring. And so on the bottom right, that's showing you same plots as before, the distribution in space of juvenile herring and diets, whereas this is a distribution of space of adult herring and diets. So you can see a real concentration of those adult herring in the Northern Strait of Georgia. So we have a very important resident herring component that's really driving high stomach fullness in the Northern Strait of Georgia. And just who those herring are, what makes them stay, and whether that resident component has changed through time is a question that may be really, really important for understanding the Strait of Georgia ecosystem. So just to recap, uh, salmon diets can inform us about spatial structure and forage fish communities. We see consistent patterns across years in our adult salmon diet sampling in the Strait of Georgia. And the Strait of Georgia seems to be this region of high stomach fullness for Chinook which at least in recent years has been driven by resident herring. So herring are important. And as a result, and, and arising from some of this work, there is uh, a BC Schrift funded Strait of Georgia herring project, which is being led by PSF's Marine Science Program to try and get at some of these questions. And I'm running fairly short on time. So I'm just gonna go through this pretty briefly, but this project has lots of partners um, led by PSF, lots of collaboration from UVic, and importantly, um, close partnerships with First Nations, with First Nations doing much of the field work uh, and working really closely with the UVic crews. And then also collaborators with Environment and Climate Change Canada um, and uh, DFO and NGOs, including Project Watershed uh, and PAC. So there's four activities. The first of these is interactions between age zero herring and juvenile Chinook and coho salmon. And that's getting at some of these questions around the availability of herring to juvenile salmon. A second is understanding this non-migratory herring component in the Strait of Georgia. And then there's a effort focused on understanding the loss of herring spawn in particular regions of the Strait. And finally, uh, an outreach activity to um, <clears throat> bring community knowledge about herring together from First Nations. So very briefly, this first component will have field work, working with nations in the field, beach sanding, per sanding, and micro trolling to understand where and when juvenile herring are available to juvenile salmon and the extent to which this is controlled by size of those herring. There will be a biomass assessment of age two herring in the Strait of Georgia, which will be the first attempt to quantify that resident component of Strait of Georgia herring population that seems so important to salmon in the Strait and is likely so important for the ecosystem as a whole. And there'll be lab work to try to be able to identify, and we, we have some really promising results on this already, to identify resident versus non-resident herring in spawning populations. There will be this uh, gap analysis to try to understand um, what factors are limiting herring spawn locations. And this is being led by Jake Dingwall at the University of Victoria. And finally, uh, there'll be this compilation of herring traditional ecological knowledge with Strait of Georgia First Nations. And this will include videography and uh, community events to bring First Nations and elders together. So we're really excited about this. Um, Forage fish are clearly a critical uh, ecosystem component for salmon. Herring are clearly really critical in the Strait of Georgia. And uh, I think it's really exciting that we're gonna be able to tackle some of these key outstanding questions about Strait of Georgia herring through this new BC trip over the next three years. So I think we're pretty much out of time, I think. So I'll leave it there. Uh, my email address is at the bottom left, uh, as is the web link for the um, Marine Science Program. And I'm happy to answer questions. Sure. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Yeah, unfortunately, we have reached the end of the time, but we'll probably keep it going because we have a recording and people can uh, revisit this uh, at the end as long as uh, the Zoom doesn't end suddenly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, if there are questions, uh, do feel free to throw them in the chat um or speak up as well 
Um, nothing has popped up in a little bit. Uh, yeah, definitely feel free to throw them in the, in the chat. Um, and thank you for attending as well. I know we're running over time, so I apologize for that, everybody. But we will have a recording that'll be sent out to everyone uh, within the week for sure. Um, I might just uh, take over the screen here, Will. I haven't seen any questions come in. Um, but with the interest of time as well, I might just pop up a way folks can get in touch with us since we are um, doing the work that Jacqueline did touch on. So if you are interested, feel free to contact me at my email on the screen there. Um, we do approximately monthly sampling as well. So if you are interested in that, please do reach out. And I'm hoping to get things going again in July. I know there's probably some volunteers in here that have been patiently waiting for my email for the next session. So uh, those will probably come up in July. Um, so sorry, I'm gonna switch back to some screens really quickly here. Oh, wrong way. But yeah, as uh, Jacqueline mentioned, we are a uh, part of the Forgefish spawning habitat sampling in Boundary Bay. Um, so we did take part in 2006, 2007, just to get kind of like a baseline of information on that. Uh, we did a separate sampling project in 2017, but we did start up again in the fall of 2023. Um, so with the goal to provide education and training to protect these species and also fill uh, those knowledge gaps um, of where these species are at and when they're spawning. Uh, and we do focus on the two species of forage fish, Pacific sand lance and uh, surf smelt. Just a quick note on some uh, results we have had since September, between September and March, uh, we had about 26 findings. So within that, there was 11 empty sand lance casings and uh, 15 unknowns as well. So still working on getting those identifications and also just completing the analysis of those uh, samples as well. Um, and so we have five different sites that we're um, sampling at between Crescent Beach and Blackie Spit. We've had about 38 volunteers join us throughout this time and about 166 hours from our volunteers. So thank you so much. Uh, for those have, that have taken part and have supported us. So there's my information again. Um, if you would like to get involved, uh, we have some optional training videos you can watch and then you can uh, join our somewhat monthly sampling as well, hoping to get consistent on the monthly basis. A uh, quick thank you to our funders for the Forage Fish Project, uh, DFO, uh, BC Nature, BC Naturalist Foundation, and of course the Coastal Forage Fish Network. We do have a couple other volunteer opportunities at Friends of Samuel Bay Society. If you might be interested in picking up some more volunteer hours, we have our European Green Crab Monitoring that we do um, every month. Uh, at least six trapping sessions every month between White Rock and Sawasan. We have opportunities in school education programs to facilitate class presentations and field trips. We're definitely looking for some technical savvy people with video and digital skills, admin, uh, Zoom help as well for sure, and community outreach uh, opportunities as well. So yeah, there's our contact on the screen. Uh, again, if you'd like to get in touch, have any other questions about this topic. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. And those that have been able to stick around for the extra five minutes, really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, hope to see you again soon at the next one. Thank you again to our speakers. And uh, we'll be sending out a um, recording out to you all shortly. Thank you so much.